I will kick things off. Um, I'm Andy. Hello, everyone. Um, Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm still reeling from the, the, the pre-chat we had before we started the webinar. L literally, I took my glass off just now because I had tears coming out of my eyes. You lot were making me laugh so much. Um, three, three strong ladies. Well, four strong ladies because Hazel as well. But um, <laughs> this should make a very interesting discussion and hopefully lots of energy and lots of takeaways. Uh, attendees, if you do want to ask a question at any point, use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Don't use the q and I mean, use the Q&A if you want to, but uh, it's the chat one. Use the chat, put your message there, we'll pick it up. We'll either answer the question um, as we're going along, or we'll say that we'll ask it at the end, but either way, we'll get to you. Um, if anyone on the attendee list wants to turn on their microphone and talk at any point in time, again, let us know in the chat. We're more than happy to have participants, but that's completely optional. Um, Hazel, do you want to take it away from here? Sure. Well, so firstly, a very warm welcome to all our webinar attendees. And how is everyone doing today? Um, our panelists today are all based in Australia, but our webinar attendees are spread across the globe. So it's good evening here in the Southern Hemisphere and it's good morning to all those joining us in the Northern Hemisphere. So during the webinar today, um, if you have any questions, again, just what Andy just said, mentioned and mentioned, uh, pop that into the chat function. We're also going to launch a couple of polls. Um, so when they're launched, it would be great if you jump on there, complete the poll, and that will help to drive our conversation today. So let me start by making some introductions. Our first panelist is Michelle Reynolds from Sky Trek Willow Springs Station in the remote Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Michelle manages all things tourism related to the family run 70,000 acre property. Big challenge. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. It's great to have you here this evening and to share your learnings and knowledge with us. Our second panellist today is Ali Urin, founder of Kickstart. Ali's business Kickstart is a tactical partner in business, learning and development for individuals and organisations in the corporate, government and tourism and hospitality sectors. Welcome, Ali. Good to have you to join us. Thank you, Hazel. Good to be here. Our third panellist is Catherine Redden, founder of Redden Media. Redian Media helps passionate rural, regional and remote business owners get out of the social media weeds and get started with leads to get them business. Welcome, Catherine. It's really good to have you with us this evening. I'm Hazel Parker. I'm the Community Ambassador for Touch Day in Australia. And Andy. And I'm Andy. I'm the CEO <coughs> of Touch Day. And my lovely voice tells you I am, well, lovely, gosh. Uh, my different voice tells you that I am not from Australia. Uh, mind you, Hazel, you had a, a Scottish accent and you're, you're Australia, in Australia. So. I am. I've been here for 12 years now, so, but I still kept my Scottish accent. Good for you. None of this Australian nonsense. Um. <laughs> well, there's a little twang every now and again. Yeah, <laughs> um, Cool. Right, let, let, let's, let's crack on. Um, as I said when I first came on air, there's lots of energy here in the panel and lots of um, ideas. And isn't it apt that it's about communicating more? So we've got the right people. <laughs> but what we want to try and do is think about how we communicate more whilst doing less and how we communicate more effectively in order for us to hopefully focus on other parts of the business. And I should say before we crack on that, um, I'm reminded that Australia is in various states going through uh, a series of lockdowns, so we do appreciate that some of what we're saying now may not be um, uh, something you can implement right away. But having been through that whole process here in the UK, probably this time last year when it was crazy with, with the, the, the pandemic, etc., we, we're now open. Um, so I know a lot of people use that time to think about how they were structuring their businesses, how they were going to think about communicating to guests once the, uh, the business opened up again. So we are mindful of that as well. All right, let's start with the first question. Michelle, I'm gonna start with you first because you're um, the only operator on the panel. I know Catherine, you have hosted Airbnb hosts in the past, but you're no longer doing it anymore. And Hazel, of course you are, but Michelle, you're our, you're our only true panelist at the moment who's operating. So 
What I wanted to ask you, first of all, is what lessons you've learned about how to communicate and manage guests, particularly because of the way, the location you are, the remoteness that you have there and the huge farm that you have there. So what, what, are, what have you learned over the years of dealing with crazy guests who come and think they can stay in a farm and find everything they'd expect back home? Um, yeah, very good question, Andy. <laughs> uh, education, education, education. It's probably one of the hardest things that we have out here, particularly um, everything being so remote, trying to make sure our guests fully understand what they're coming to. It's, um, it's about, it'd be 25 minutes to our closest attempt of a, a grocery store, which is an express IGA. So for those of you overseas, it's pretty much like running down just to the corner store um, and even less. So trying to educate people that they need to be able to have everything with them before they get here is really quite difficult. Um, Look, we've, we've been through all the processes. We've tried putting it all on the website. We've tried um, explaining it via email, explaining it via phone. It does all help, um, but that was certainly where Touch Day made a huge difference for us because we were able to actually remind people um, of everything they need to know before they get here, and it was something they could just refer to at any time of the day and they had all the answers they need. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for, for mentioning that the touch day was brilliant at that. Yes. Um, but, um, there, there must be other kind of things in your, in your kind of toolkit of stuff that, I don't know, that, that, um, that enabled you to get across important stuff to the traveler before they arrive. Like, is there some, is there another mode of communication or another tactic you've used other than touch day? Um, yeah, definitely our website. Um, we also use social media quite a bit. Um, if any guests are reaching out via phone or email, we try to communicate as much as we can over that as well. Um, so with emails, we're sort of touching base with them. Obviously, once they book, we're then touching base about a week prior and then again two days prior. Um, so just really reaching out to them that way. Um to be honest, though, look, for out here, most of our marketing or information or education is all just spread by word of mouth. I mean, our biggest advertiser for us is people telling each other stories about their time in the Flinders Ranges and Outback, and that makes a hell of a difference. Okay, that, that's, that's an important one. We'll come back to that, actually, because I think that that idea of communicating more a sense of your brand and what the experience is going to be like is, is really is, is a huge driver. Okay, cool. Let, let's hold that there, Michelle. Um, uh, all I've just seen pop up, Hazel. Oh, yeah. So can we um, just have our participants maybe jump onto the poll now? And if you could pop your answers in there, that would be great. Thank you. Although us panellists can't vote, as I found out before. <laughs> Um, good. Right. Uh, Catherine, let's come to you because you, you, you did host. Um, I don't know how long ago it was, but you did host. I had about a thousand guests. We hosted in how we were in home Air Airbnb hosts. And I was thinking today, probably about a thousand guests. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. So that, that's plenty of um, guests to have figured out how to communicate more effectively. And I know when we spoke um, a couple of weeks ago, you were a fan of the really simple things, like just the stuff that you ordinarily, you try and over-engineer something, but it's actually something really simple to, to effectively communicate. I just try to think about what they might complain about and always say to them, and it's a bit like dating. It's I did a lot of online dating before I met my husband, and I figured out really quickly that you have to lower people's expectations before they meet you. <laughs> and so for me, it was about saying to the dude, listen, you know that I'm five, nine, and a hundred years old and a size 22 and I'm loud. So just so before they met me, they would know what they were gonna get. And I found exactly the same with guests. I would had a little pro forma email that would go, would say to them in dot points, just wanna make sure that you know we've got dogs, that you know we're two kilometers from the train station and that's a 20 minute walk. You know that you don't have your own bathroom. Even though all the stuff was in my ad and everywhere, I would always double check beforehand and I would say, and hey, just to make sure that you've read this, could you just email back with a, hey, yeah, that's fine. Because I wanted to 
meet their expectations before they even got to us because there's no hiding when you stay with someone there's no hiding what you like <laughs> um and the other thing i i did as well which i picked up this could have been from Tyan, actually. Tyan was someone I met on the internet very early on. And I think it was she that recommended saying something like, so the, after they checked in, my first message to them would be, you know, hope you're having a good stay, et cetera, et cetera. And if your stay is not to your five-star expectations, please let me know. And so what that would do is prompt a conversation rather than getting a review, because I would sometimes get a review that mentioned stuff that I could have fixed during oh. the stay. And so that would kind of, and, and also realizing that you can't be for everyone. You're going to have a bad review every now and again. No amount of communication is going to help some stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and to sort of, you know, do your best. And yeah, I, and it took, took me a couple of bad reviews and, you know, probably a, a long time to get to that, just trying new things and, you know, a couple of psychopaths later, I thought, oh, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Um, yeah, I think I think you said something that Michelle said, which is about um, repetition. And um, I know it's 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 ingrained in kind of all of us humans to kind of filter things out that aren't sort of really important for us there and then. And if if there's a repetition, then you you are increasing the chance that the moment it does become important for the guest, they'll they'll know about it and they'll have seen it. So um, that's often something that's so simple. It's like tell people more than once, you know, just tell them multiple times. And I think it's I think it's it's a it's it's so simple, but it's a whopping changer in terms of expectations. I mean, I'm going to butt in here, and I probably will for the next forty five minutes, Keep and also it. not be pa not be passive aggressive about it. So I've stayed at a lot of Airbnbs before as well. Something that triggers me as a guest is getting a message that said, "As I said before," or "As indicated in the Airbnb ad," or "Like it says on our website." I'm, I don't care about that. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm on holiday, or I'm here for business. And you may have told me that toilet paper is under the sink. <laughs> but I may not have looked, but I don't need you to be passive aggressive about that. And I know it's annoying for you. I get it. I, I was a host, but just to try and you're right. Like not everybody reads things the same way in marketing. There's an actual myth that's been debunked that says you need to see something seven times before it sinks in. Probably with a guest, it's like a hundred, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah, I just, and just to kind of take it, Look, most people on holidays are stupid. We've got our brains in stupid mode, you know. We we don't have our brains switched on like Monday morning, you know. Like we, so just to yeah, just cut your guess a little bit of slack. And you're you're, to you're totally right. And we do have vacation brains. I have a perfect example. A, a few weeks ago, I went on holiday with a family, and we went to stay with a touch day customer. Braga, we can't go on holidays. Braga. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> just just indulge me. But but it's to your point. I, I rocked up to it's it's a it's a an old stud farm which had like I can't remember how many cottages but lots of cottages and I have my touch day guide on my phone and I'm like navigating or my wife's navigating and we get to the place and there's no key in the front door and the the, the guide said there'll be a key in the front door there wasn't one so I thought oh that's a bit strange so I opened the door and there's a guy walking past and I said um, where's the key in the front door and he said well which which cottage are you staying at and I said this one. And he kind of looked at me and he went, I don't think you are. Clearly it wasn't ready. Like he did not want anyone to stay at that cottage. And I realized I'd been looking at completely the wrong touch day guy because I run touch day. I see all of their guides. I was looking at the wrong one. And it's such a stupid thing. But as a guest, the moment you walk out your front door to go on holiday, you switch off. And you're right, Catherine, don't tell me. I've told you before the toilet roll is under the sink. I'm just a guest. I forget stuff, you know, and it's really annoying. Where's the sink? Do you know which sink do you mean? Like I've searched your laundry and every, what, you mean the Outback Dunny sink? Oh, it's out there, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, Ali, let's bring you in at this, at this point because you're not um, an operator, but I know you have um, a, a really strong perspective on um, communication and, mm. and, and, and particularly as lot, a, a lot as well about business transformation, which I think is some really interesting stuff there. But talk to us about your perspective on this and the idea of how to communicate more effectively with us vacation brain guests. 
Yeah, okay. So, look, I think I'll go back and I'll look at it from more of a holistic point of view. And, of course, Michelle and I worked together, um, you know, really for quite some time, didn't we, Michelle, on a wonderful project and you're still reeling from it. But, hey, look what it produced. But I think it really is about being honest and brave enough to look at your own gaps and uh, threats and risk to your own business and how you actually communicate first up. Like, you can't innovate if you're just going to be banging on about how good you are at things and, and looking at your strengths all the time. So I think if you want to get better and truly evolve the way you communicate, work with someone who can create a supportive environment in which to look at your gaps and the threats first up. And that's what we did with everyone. It's what I do. It's a piece of work I do before I go anywhere with any client or business is to actually do a process around how we innovate off our skill gaps. And that's certainly what we did with Michelle to be able to um, get the outcomes that um, Sky Trek Willow Springs, um, you know, but, and look at it from a holistic point of view too, right? So look at it from, I think a lot of operators, and I'll say this with a lot of love, I think a lot of tourism operators get into this space because they think it's easy or they think it's romantic. Um, it's not, it's hard yakka. And you're in business at the end of the day too, right? Like it's a business, it's got to run as a business. And I think at the end of the day, everyone, whether or not it's the neurosurgeon fixing your brain, the person fixing your teeth, the person selling you flowers, myself, Michelle, um, Catherine, we are in the service industry. So serve people. And I think we've lost the, the actual art of knowing how to make people feel good at times, right? And actually, it's hard work. And I don't mean that badly. I mean, bad, but it takes a certain type of person and a certain type of attitude, you know, and a certain type of business. But I think to do the work and to really be able to evolve business and to use, I think, touch, stay um, uh, to its full potential or anything that you're doing in business is you are there to make people feel good and to walk away and say, that was a really good use of my money or my holidays. You know, if you're like me, half an hour a year. Um, not really, but close. And I've chosen that. So no, no complaining. Uh, but um, we, we lo we've lost the art of it. Like it's not something to be celebrated. And it is. I've always been in the service industry. I have been from the age I was 15 and I'll always be in the service industry, regardless of what company I own or run or role I take on it. It always is. So I think um, be brave enough to delve in to the things that you're not great at and uh, do the work on yourself where you need to and certainly outsource to great people when you need to as well. You don't have to do everything but you do need to step up and own what's in your sphere of responsibility too. Ali, about that as well, is a lot of how we communicate with guests is by writing. I know that sounds a bit dumb, but a yeah. lot of a lot of how we communicate with guests is by writing and it's not everybody's strong suit. No. And, and also when it's our baby, and I, I, I could be wrong, but my experience of Airbnb hosts and accommodation owners is for a lot of them, it started as a passion and it's developed into a business. And yeah. so when it's your baby, you just want to describe how pretty it is. You don't yeah. necessarily want to say, oh, it does really bad farts after it has Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, and not so, at all. And like I said, the, the, pe the guest doesn't need to know about the fart, but the fart needs to be dealt with if it's going to become an issue. Exactly. And you need to, and if writing's not your strong suit, so there's a whole lot of things going on. Writing's not your strong suit. You want your guests to be perfect all the time. It's your baby. You think you can sell to everyone. Don't get me started on not having a no, niche. Don't, don't start on that. <laughs> no, <I'm> not. <laughs> not, not the right webinar. But, no, you know, you think no. you can sell to, you think you can sell to everyone. When something goes wrong, you take it really personally because it's on the website. Do you know what I mean? And so why hasn't the guest noticed? So I think there's a, a whole lot of stuff going on. And I would say, Ali, that's great advice is to go back, see where your gaps are. And if it's going to affect your guest, be brave enough to put that in your copy, your writing. Yeah. Be brave enough to put that on your website. Be brave yeah. enough and to put that in. And also video too, right? I think we need to be using video, video as well, yeah. right, to show who we are. And like I said, you know, not everyone likes to get on camera, um, but the more you do it, the better you'll get at it too, right? But to actually Absolutely. show personality. Show personality, right? Let people know because people do think, what if I don't like that person? What if I'm going to be there for a while, right? And I think we can do, we need to personalise it. Well, still making it efficient, but video can be a great way um, to be able to show Absolutely. That people buy from people. People buy from people. I just want to say that again. People don't buy from a logo. People yeah. 
people buy from people and the quickest way in in social media we're on a tangent now sorry andy to get no to get no like and trust so to get is is on video i want to tell you something about video none of my clients want to get on video none of them none of them want to get on video the only client that I've ever had that wanted to get on video was a full on narcissist. And so I would say, if you don't want to get on video, good, because that means you're an ordinary person. <laughs> but get if if but if you want to but if you want to grow your business, you have to get do things video. to make you feel uncomfortable. I've got yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I did four hundred yeah. of them. I didn't really want to do it, yeah. but I have to. Good. Okay, so well done. So I've done four hundred and now I'm I'm not I'm over myself. I can I'm okay with it, right? But um, you know, people get um yeah. get, you just have to do the things that make you feel uncomfortable and work with the right people to help you do that, Andy. I think that's what I'd say on that. Yeah, uh, uh, I think I think really good discussions there. And the, the bit about maybe going off tangent with with um, defining what you um, what you don't want to attract is is good. I mean, that's all about communication. I mean, it, this, this is about how to filter out the guests that you don't want as much as it is about how you then communicate to those guests who are booked. So I think, I think it's all relevant. Catherine, did you want to come in again? I just want to, I just want to say why that's important because often people don't understand why it's important to attract guests that you want to have to you. The reason it's important is because your ideal guest is going to know other ideal guests and you want them to come and stay as well. So your ideal guest, let's just say it's a family with two kids. They're gonna know other people like that. If you start attracting older people with no kids, they don't know your ideal guest. <laughs> so attracting your ideal guest is really important because they also know your uh, ideal guest and they'll talk about you positively uh -huh. if you've yeah. communicated effectively. Agreed, agreed. Before we go Can on. Can I just I jump in there, Andy? We've now mm. got the results of our first poll. Um, so we asked which channels do you use? We've got 50% use SMS, 40% communicate through their OTAs, 100% communicate by email, 70% by phone, 30% use WhatsApp, and 10% use other. Okay. <clears throat> Not unexpected, I would say. <clears throat> um, email, obviously, followed closely by what's uh, by SMS and then WhatsApp. WhatsApp is that is that not really an Australian thing, or is that just because it's still lagging? Um, we certainly don't have much WhatsApp um, within okay. our business today. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, good. Thank you. Did did we want to put the second poll up whilst we're in poll mode or not? <laughs> Yes. Yep, that's just gone up now. So if um, everybody can jump on there and answer the couple of questions we've got there, thank you. I'll just, um, just while we're doing that, Andy, if I can just jump in there. Um, Catherine, you made a really good point about don't, don't communicate or don't attract the guests that are not your ideal guests. Sometimes that can fall out of your, um, you know, it, it just happens. <laughs> um, particularly, I can safely say with the COVID pandemic, I cannot believe how many of our non-ideal guests have actually decided to come and stay at Willow Springs. And it has been a challenge. Um, you talked about being passionate about your business and then it later just becoming a business. Mm. There are days after those guests where you get to the point where it is just a business. It's really hard to stay passionate when you're putting a lot of energy into keeping those ones happy. What I do find, though, is um, I think a really important is, uh, part of it is don't necessarily turn them away completely. If you can, refer them on to something local that is going to be more ideal for them. Um, they might not hang around with your most ideal guest all the time, but they will certainly have contact with one at some point. So whether that is, like you said, the grandparents that come through, we might not be ideal for them. But if we can get them in the area and they know that we made the effort um, to find them somewhere that they were happy, they'll go and say back to their grandchildren or their 
you know, their son and daughter or anything like that, hey, um, we didn't end up staying with them, but they were such lovely people. And I think they would be right up what you're looking for. Um, you know, make sure you check them out. So I think it is, it's, yes, look for your ideal guests, but don't necessarily get rid of them completely because they do have a contact. Okay, good observation. Thank you. Um, Ali, I just want to, um, it, it's, a, it's a slightly different sort of question, but given that we are, well, given that you all are going through the pandemic at the height of stuff right now, and we have been through that, um, it, it, there's a lot of people that start challenging what they're doing in the business and why they're mm -hmm. doing it. Um, and whilst that's going on, the, the traveler starts to change a bit as well because they have a different expectation. Um, perhaps they fall back more onto brands that they feel they know and they trust. Um, you know, maybe they turn more to Airbnb because I don't know whether this is true or not. But you've got a lot of stuff on your website, which I think is really interesting about the, the, the examples in nature of how nature kind of reinvents itself when faced with yeah. challenges. And it strikes me that that's what we're going through at the moment. So what, what would you, it, do you feel like the way that people communicate um, needs to change now going forward and the things that they communicate need to change more going forward, having just yeah. gone through and going through what we're going through? Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things I want to say around that. Um, if you want to see a cane toad, a Mexican cave fish and a finch, um, go to the website. People say, what is that? There's a story behind it, but very much so. And I think um, a couple of things, and I want to come back to the example of Michelle, if I can exhibit A, um, Michelle, is when you look at how people communicate normally on a line, you know, if you looked at it like a flow from end to end, operators' business in general, not even operators, will put a lot of energy in uh, attracting and when people you know, actually getting people into the business right once they're in the business they don't do much about maintaining a relationship afterwards right so we recognize and don't think I'm talking out of school here Michelle that there was more work to be done at the beginning even before they'd made a decision to come um, and book with Skytrek so we had a lot to do in the initial stages um, great once I'd booked yep awesome and then afterwards as well in maintaining that and I think there needs to be firstly if you think about people um, in lockdown after lockdown, and I'm in ta uh, Tasmania. Um, that's Tasmania, not Tanzania. People get confused. Um, so <laughs> and I'm not even joking about that. Quite and they, um, they think, oh, Tanzania. No, 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 Tasmania. Next stop, Antarctica. Go check it out. But um, people at the moment, I think they always have, but people have a need at the moment to be psychologically safe. Um, and that's really important. So anything that you can do in your business even before they book, even before the money's in the in the in your in your bank account, what can you do in those initial stages of communication to make people feel that you and that you are credible, make people safe, that it's a good decision? Um, I think we need to be doing that um, to a far greater degree than we ever had. I think we need to be using real evidence and examples too in a way that's interesting um, around that rather than go, hey, yeah, we're, we're real safe. Come, come stay with us. I think we need to actually give much more detail and work a lot harder and be more creative in how we make people feel secure in, in that decision that they're making to stay with us. And as I said, we need to think about it as a, as an end-to-end -end experience rather than when they've booked and they're actually in our place. And I think people want to know um, exactly what that's going to look like. And so building testimonials, getting video testimonials, once again, I know I'm on about that. That's from someone who didn't want to do them. Um, but really building a case and, you know, at the end of the day, people do want real evidence um, and examples of that. And I think people want to go away. They want to feel good about their decision. Um, but they do really, I think at the moment, particularly in Australia, where things are locking and shutting and, you know, just because you live in a state, particularly Tasmania, you're not guaranteed that they'll let you back in. So that's, you know, people are having to either stay where they are, right, which is very hard if you, unless you've got lots of money, right? So uh, it's not a guarantee that if you leave Tasmania, go to the mainland, get stuck, that you'll actually be able to come back into your state of residency. Mm. So it's very interesting. So, yeah. Okay. Catherine, you were going to say something. I'm back in primary school. <laughs> when you run your own business, you get to talk all the time whenever you want. You don't have to listen to anyone else. Now, we well, you um, have to behave yourself now. That's right. 
One thing I feel, and I understand that not everyone on this call, that's how old I am, webinar, whatever it is, is from Australia, but this applies to anywhere you are. One thing that's happening in purchasing is that we're buying more locally. And I think that's a, I'm going to speak about Australia, but if you're in the Netherlands, hi Janine, just apply this to the Netherlands, right? It, it, it matters everywhere. So one of my clients is a caravan manufacturer and his business has doubled twice during COVID. It, the caravan industry is seeing unprecedented growth in Australia because people now know they have to travel at home, probably for a while. And what that is, is a massive opportunity for, and I know that it's hard when people can't travel to have someone like me say, hey, accommodation industry is a massive opportunity. <laughs> so forgive me. But there is an opportunity, I think, for us to look locally and look about what our, what our, stay, what our accommodation, what our experience offers that's really unique and really Australian. That doesn't mean I've actually been to Willow Springs, which is a massive coincidence because I didn't know that Michelle was coming. I know I went, I think it was 2006 or 2007. My husband who's just got home loves, is a bit of a full drive nuffy. And um, so we've been there and we had a great time, but I'm not saying it doesn't have to be all kangaroos and dirt tracks. Like there's something that people are looking for that says my community. And also, bit of a tangent, there's a massive opportunity for Australian tourism businesses to capture the market in Australia of second and third generation Aussies, and I'm just going to say it, from Southeast Asian countries whose parents emigrated here 20 or 30 years ago, have worked really bloody hard, given their kids an education. And this is a massive like stereotype. They've given their kids an education. Their kids have become lawyers and doctors and teachers, and now they want to see Australia. And now they want to show their kids, this is the country I grew up in, and I want to show it to you because I don't know much about it. And I just think there is a, a really big opportunity for travel and tourism in the next five to 10 years to really capitalize on having a holiday at home and how safe it is mm. how, how, and how, how fun it is and how, you know, what an experience it is to give your kids. So instead of taking your kids to Disney, mm. give them that experience of, we've got the biggest, you know, we've got a massive landmass here from cane toads to, Tassie devils, you know. So that that's what I think. There's an opportunity. It, it's it, 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 sorry, Ali, go go for it. You go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry, I just wanted to say something on on the end of that. Is that particularly with the outback as well? And, and I think, like Catherine said, anywhere in the world, you'd be able to look at your own example. But people have their own perceptions. People have their own. You know, it is an adventure. So people get quite nervous at times going into these places, right? Because they're not mainstream, and they do have a level of risk attached to it as well. So it's going to be important to actually get real about that because then you can craft your comms and your style and your manner in responding to that as well too, so that you're all, you're acknowledging it already. Um, but I do think it's about uh, building a brand that people trust absolutely and that they feel um, while it's an adventure that we've got, we've got your back and you're gonna be okay. We're gonna make sure that you get the most from it and this is how we're gonna do it. Really setting it out in a very, very clear way, I think it's really important. So I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, I think that's really important because I think it's it's often easy to think about um, you know the landscape and what's changing, etc. But it's harder to then think about how, as an individual, you you capitalise that and you you make it a reality in your business, in your website, in you know everything you do. It can be hard to make that leap. I, I would it, thinking of Australian examples, and and yes, I hear you, Catherine. We we don't necessarily have just Australians on here, but uh, the Australian example is a customer of ours called Unyoked. I don't know if you guys have heard of Unyoked. Mm. Um, have a look. I think it's I think it's unyoked.co or .io. It's one of these kind of newfangled kind of website extensions. But unyoked, they've um, they've partnered with people who've got lots of land all around Australia, but close to um, cities to put. They basically come and build small houses on that land. And what I love about their brand and their concept and their website is it's not just about oh there's a there's a there's a house on this kind of um, patch of land that wasn't used before it's the way that they've sold the dream um, it's the way they've written really whimsically about this idea of escape you know it almost turns into the kind of some romantic thing whereas we know often there's lots of hard hard practicalities of going to stay somewhere really remote but it's the hooking into the emotion 
And coming back to what Catherine said there, why do we go on holiday? Um, we go on holiday to kind of escape where we are now to go somewhere else. But the reality is that somewhere else exists on your doorstep. It's just that we think we have to get on a plane to go and find it. We've been through that here in the UK. That thing I just mentioned a few weeks ago where I went on holiday, two weeks in the UK, had one of the best times ever, some really, really great places. So I, I, do, I do think it's a really, really strong and real phenomenon, but it's hard to put that into like website, uh, into your Airbnb listing, et cetera. To Can explain. I say something just yeah, briefly on that? Um, I don't, when I'm working with clients, I don't talk about the, um, the unique uh, proposition as such, yeah? They always talk about the USP, unique selling proposition. I actually talk about the unique emotional proposition, which yeah. is the UEP, which is exactly what you're talking about, Andy. How do I want people to feel as a result of actually being in my place and having this experience with me? So we're coming from an emotional piece rather than purely the, the product or, or, you know, yeah. or what we're selling per se. Yeah. Mm, good point you made um, just on that point, you all probably already know this, but it is a universal truth that people buy on emotion and justify their purchase on logic. So when you are marketing your property, think about what you want, what your cust what your guest, I forget where I am, what your guest wants to feel when they're at your place. That's the first thing, get them to feel something and then you justify it. It's an experience, it's a family holiday, it's a whatever it is. But if you follow that, you'll see a little more uptake. But yeah, Ali, I absolutely agree. I always get the people, we all buy on emotion, everything. I defy you to think of something you haven't bought with on emotion. Yeah. I, so I, I, just, uh, I was gonna just jump in, we do have the results of the poll, the last poll, two, two questions. So the first one was, um, you know, how many times do you communicate with guests after booking? 50% have said um, one to two times and the 50% of that said three to five times, um, which is which is actually quite low. I think, um, you know, I average six or seven communications with my guests. And I know some people have maybe 10, 14 <laughs> different communications. So, um, Hazel, let, let's bring it back to the, the, I love this discussion we're having about, you know, how to connect more with a guest. And, and it, that is about communicating. So it's totally relevant. But let's bring it back really to kind of the point in the webinar, which was how you communicate more and why communicating more ends up helping you do less. So, Hazel, that's a really timely thing. Half of the people are saying they only communicate one to two times after booking. Why do you communicate so many more times? And does that help you? step back a bit from the guest sure room. sure well I think I mean I think the first thing is you can never give your guests too much information um, as long as it's relevant to them and they'll get engaged with it and I think from the point of um, well even before the booking comes in your, your, your communication starts with your website and your social media to get them hooked and once they're there you want to continue that experience for them so you don't, they don't just make the booking and then it all goes dead until they arrive um, so, I mean, our, our communications start literally from the day or the day after we get our booking um, booking in um, with a lovely welcoming e email to them, um, you know, just giving a bit more information, a little bit about the property. And, you know, we put in our, our link to our, our touch day guide there so that they've got access to all the information about the property. Um, and they got that from day one. Not, it's you know, the, in the old days, they wouldn't get that until they arrived at the property. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that, you know, we kick that off like from day one of the booking um, and then depending on how long the, you know, if, if the bookings may be two months in advance, then our next communication will maybe go out a month before um, our arrival. And, you know, we start introducing them to the area, uh, events that are going on in the area, if there's maybe any particular restaurants that we'd like, like to recommend to them, urging them particularly as we've still got COVID restrictions, if you know they're on limited capacity, it's really important to make a booking. Can I help them with that? Um, and then um, two weeks before we send out another communication, just reminding them that you know if they haven't made any bookings yet, they can con you know I can do that for them. Um, you know, is there anything that they you know I need, they need me to do when they get here? You know, I ask them about their dietary requirements. A week before arrival, again, I just touch base with them, you know, just saying hope everything's okay. We're really looking forward to seeing them. And again, it's just a chatty email to keep them in the loop that we're still, you know, we're interested and we know that, you know, we're looking forward to having them. And then right up until the day before they arrive, the day before they arrive, we, we send them a text with, the, with their touch day guidebook again. And I have to say that the, te the text that goes out, you know, and we can, we can do 
how many times people are viewing that, that's probably the most viewed <laughs> thing out, out of all of the um, times that they get, they get our links, you know, with the guidebook. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll email, I'll, I'll text them on the day just to confirm what time they're arriving. So that's about six or seven different, you know, touch points throughout that process. And I know that, you know, we are hosted accommodation and people tend to be here just for two or three days at a time. Perhaps people who are going to a holiday, like they're going for a week or a fortnight, there may be lots more things that need to be communicated during that run up to the, you know, to the holiday. So there may, may, be, may be more opportunity to have more touch points. And I think when the guests, when the guests eventually arrive, they feel that they know me and I feel that I already know, know them. <laughs> so you've already built a relationship with them. Do, but do you think that the guests, um, have you ever had guests going, can you stop with so many communications? Like I don't expect you do because guests, uh, well, we're, we're mostly polite, but do, do you feel like you're over communicating? No, no, not not at all. And I've never I've never had AMD say to me, gosh, we've got so many emails from you. I think it's just important to make sure that you're 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 writing in the right way. And you know, you mentioned, Catherine, that some people are not that great at communicating. And if you do have difficulty putting it into words, then you know, speak to somebody who's a good communicator to help you craft those templates. You know, because it's all templates, you know, you don't need to change it for every single guest. All you're doing is maybe adding a name or just tweaking it at the end and it, and it's gone. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, because you've got that all automated and all templated, I don't spend a huge amount of time actually communicating, but my guests get a lot of communication. Is that Does that sort of answer the question, Andy? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Catherine, go. I can see you. You're there was a question from Kelly that said, how do you avoid harassing the guests? And I would just say, depending on what literature you read, there's probably four different types of com communication styles. There are about four different, different people like to be communicated with differently. And yes, some people will feel harassed by that. I might be one of those people, but I just delete the email. And then I click on the text that I get the day before. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was me at 4.30 going, oh, where is the Zoom link to this thing I'm doing tonight? So, yeah. you know, but there are some people who really need a lot of, we know those people, they need a lot of explanation to feel comfortable. They need a lot of the technical stuff. They need the code to the safe, you know, four weeks before they get there. So I think, yet yeah, some people might feel harassed, but you're safeguarding yourself for those people who really need a lot of calm, who really need a lot of security and communications. And the ones like me that get a little bit like, can you just shorten it? Like, we'll relax once we're there. It's not going to make me leave a bad review. It's going to make me think yeah, you're good at your true. job, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, Ali, were, were you going to say something? I couldn't work out whether. No, no, I couldn't work it out. No, I <laughs> I'm not looking for signs. Just no, 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 no. And I, I look. I think you're yeah, absolutely right. And I think we have to think about too how the lives that we're all living now too, right? Um, particularly, you know, the busyness, the 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 messages, the amount of content that we're being exposed to. I would certainly um, appreciate Hazel's contact and certainly the day before. And I think it's timing and the pacing of that. But once again, you know, we are in the business of making um, our experiences and our business accessible to people. And accessibility means lots of different things. Um, but in a comms um, perspective, I really think it means understanding the lives that, um, you know, your guests, particularly if they're still working or they're career orientated or they're, you know, they, they I need it, you know, Having, I've got two roles at the moment, and they're big roles, and um, I would relish anything that, and Catherine, on the back end of what Catherine, anything that will make my life easier, anything that makes me not have to think any, mm -hmm. you know, any harder than I have to regarding the roles that I'm already doing in business is going to be well received. And as I said, it's not about me. I'm not communicating for me. I'm communicating for the guests, and I really have to have a finite understanding of how they live, what's happening in their world to be able to respond to that as well to in a way that's appropriate and has impact. Mm. So do you find guests I used to find, and I'm interested in what Michelle and Hazel think about this, the more communication I had with a guest before they stayed, the less of a problem they were during their stay. That's what I found. I found if I could allay their fears and they knew I was going to respond to them, they were not the ones who would send me texts at midnight saying, where's the key safe? <laughs> <laughs> what have you guys found? 
definitely. I, I mean, my my guest. Um, uh, <laughs> I can't even think of a guest who's had a, you know, I've had, a, I've had a bad experience with them. Um, but I think that, you know, what you were saying is that, uh, Catherine, is that, you know, you're the type of person who doesn't need all the communication, but, and you get rid of it if you don't, if you don't want to read it. Um, but I think that it definitely means when the guests arrive, at least they know that you've attempted to communicate with them. And if they've chosen not to read it, that's fine. Um, but absolutely. When they get- but when they get here, um, because my my main is a is a is a host and somebody who's only here for two or three days is I want them to get the best out of their stay, which includes the time at the property and the time out in the area. So for me, you know, you have to get, you know, you have to try and sort of, you know, gently push that them into reading the information that you're giving them to say, look, this is for your benefit. You know, we want you to get maximum out of your time here. <laughs> you know, there's so much. Maybe to do you just want them to come back. <laughs> Yeah, of course we do. Maybe they <laughs> Michelle, did you have a different take on that? Um, uh, look, I don't I don't think I have a different different take. We're uh, we're pretty lucky. We don't have phone service out here, so I don't need to worry about the 12 o'clock uh, text message. <laughs> <laughs> um no, look, I think we probably have completely different challenges um when it comes to communications. I mean, the biggest thing for us is connectivity. So, you know, we're in such a fast paced world now where people like yourself, Catherine, are reading the message um, that half an hour prior to before they're about to walk out the door and go, crap, what are the last things that I need? <laughs> um, whereas once they're up here in the Flinders, they don't have that ability. So look, our communications, we are trying to catch as much as we can before they get to the region. Once they're in region, we have the challenge that they can't access half of that information like you said earlier there's only so much that your advert can say or um you know your brochure or something like that until they're actually there on site it does make um it quite difficult so we use a lot of different methods to communicate with our guests um as i said we've got the website we've got our social media we've got um the email all of that. So we're trying to hit them before they get here. And once they're actually here on site, one of our most important things um, with any of our guests is the meet and greet. And then that's the opportunity to kind of finalize any of those concerns that they may have. Um, The major ones, I think he said about the ones that need to know the passcode about a month prior, they will make themselves known trust me they will give you a call they will email you they will do everything they possibly can to find out the answers that they need or the concerns that they have um it's the ones we find the most interesting are the ones that get here and then go oh crap i didn't think about that so (laughs) they're the ones that once we have that meet and greet like conversation um and again i think that's where uh, I keep saying it, but honestly, touch day has just changed things for us completely. And a big part of that is because it is accessible offline. And that makes a huge difference for us out here because people are still grabbing their phones, as you said, at the very last minute, and they're trying to find out information which they couldn't do before. But with touch day now, we've got Q and A's on there. We've got um, you know some of the most important things to consider. Um, Hazel, you said about wanting them to get the most out of their stay. By the time they've come up to us here, we're six hours to the closest city. Um, We're an hour from the closest town. So you've been out of phone service for at least an hour before you get to us. Um, If you've already stayed at somewhere prior, you probably haven't had an opportunity to have a bit of a look through what you can see and do and that's what our touch day program does is that um we do focus a lot about suggested itineraries suggested drives all of that so it's using all of those methods to kind of reach through to them if that makes sense it does make sense um but michelle if if all of these ways of communicating are um helping because you're reducing the angst of the guest and the number of questions you're fielding, et cetera. What, what are you then doing with that time? I mean, what's, what's the payoff for this? Like, <laughs> I mean, I know, I know a 70,000 place does not kind of just run itself, but <laughs> presumably there's a goal for people who want to communicate less. Like what, what, what's, I know what the answer is, but what, what would you do with more time? 
Um, yeah, welcome to being owner operator. Um, so we have housekeeping, we have pastoralists to sort out, we have, um, yeah, it's still all your office. I mean, the sounds silly, but one of the bonuses of being communicating so well is that more people are referring you, more people are recommending you, you're becoming more popular, um, all of a sudden your visitation is climbing. So when you are just handling one guest to suddenly we're handling 10, um, you have the time to be able to do so, which is always really helpful. Um, but it's, yeah, it's about being able to get all the other jobs done. Um, look, social media, you could sit there for 10, 15 minutes every day, or you could use an hour at the start of the month to try and get all of those, you know, post um, scheduled, ready to go. It's the same thing with your communications. Save your time while you can so that you can put more effort, effort into other areas of the business. Andy, uh, can I say something to that just quickly, if I can very briefly? Um, I think both what Hazel talked about and Michelle, the reason they're very good at what they can do, or what they do do, and using obviously touch stay as part of it, is they have very good processes. So they don't just, it doesn't happen by chance. and just wake up and go, oh, yeah, I've got this time now. They've actually gone through and dedicated time rather than keep saying, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I actually have a disclaimer that if you say that you're too busy, don't spend your money with my company. You need to leave because you won't be able to work on what I need you to do, what we do together to get the outcome. So while this is all very creative and awesome and evolves people's business, it is on a very strong, um, solid foundation of proper process and systems. Might not be sexy, but is really absolutely essential to this working. And I know that Michelle and I have spent seven months together working on this. So I'm coming from a place of, you know, Michelle, you, you obviously have that experience too. But, and Hazel, I've known you for a number of years and I've seen the evolution of your business. But it, it, it does come down to being committed and consistent in terms of your processes. This is where, this is where I was ultimately going, really, is that uh, if, if, if you're trying to do something to change your business, mm. there has to be not just the why, what's the outcome, but the bit up front, which is, can I do this properly? Am I committed yep. to doing this? And I think, yeah, go on, Ali. No, no, sorry, Andy, just quickly around that is you've got to think about what you actually want to become right in the middle of it, right in the middle of the DNA of the business is what are you going to be? What do you want to be? I'll be quiet now, but that's not even, I'm not even, we're not even talking really even the what or the why. Or the how it comes down to the bead. Yeah, yeah. Andy, we've got uh, another question from Kelly. Um, so she said co her comments before and during she thinks are okay uh, with that, but she says it's much harder dealing with comments about breakages and damages, and also getting their review reviews once the guests have have left. And you know, we got any advice on on that? Mm. I'd go to you. <laughs> 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 Michelle got some stories about breakages. breakages. <laughs> um, oh, look, I think uh, again, we're pretty, we're pretty lucky up here. I mean, people, and I think that is, like you said, Catherine, it's part about being approachable and um, allowing your guests to be able to either, if you are in an area where they can message you, do so at the time or come and see you during their stay, um, which is one thing. Yeah, look, I'm not going to lie. I spend a fair bit of time doing reviews, but as Hazel said, templates are amazing. You can just, you know, alter them a little bit to be able to work with what the guest has mentioned or if there's been any issues. Breakages, I think they're a given. We know that it happens here. Um, covering yourself as best as you can. Try and put some comms in early. Um, I mean, I know some of our stuff does actually, you know, with our communications prior, we say, look, we, we expect that some things will happen and that's okay. If it is a major breakage, please let us know so that we can do something about it straight away for your safety and your comfort. Um, so I think addressing that early on, if possible, is helpful. Having those templates ready afterwards is also really helpful. I would just add in on the review side of things, um, you know, we, we have our standard templates set up to go out after the guest 
um, has left. Um, we've got our reviews um, tab in our guidebook. But one other thing which I re actually introduced recently, um, which I found is working so well, is I have, I have a little thank you card, which I put in their breakfast hamper on their final day. And on the back of that card, I have QR codes directly to my Google reviews and to my TripAdvisor reviews. What I've been finding is they actually sit over breakfast, their final breakfast, and they actually do their reviews before they leave. <laughs> That's gold. The QR code is, is having a comeback. I love it. Isn't it we, just? We love the QR yeah. code. I, the QR code. Is, that is so genius, Hazel. I want to say something that's going to be controversial about reviews and breakages. You ready? We're ready. Don't, don't <laughs> pester your guests for reviews because we hate it. Like as a guest, I hate being pestered for reviews. It is not my job to review your property. Honestly, I've paid to stay there. So are you saying not, you'll, you'll review if you want to? So it doesn't yep, really matter. Yeah, and I... I, and I yeah. yeah, when I ran a Facebook group with about 5,000 hosts, it was one thing that if I ever wanted to clear out a few members, I would just give this opinion. Also, breakages are the cost of doing business. Now, if somebody breaks your car, clearly that's a thing. But breakages for minor things are the cost of doing business. And also, I'm human. It depends how much you like the guest. I had a guest once, Sven, who shall not be named, cook a pie in the microwave for 20 minutes and burn down half my kitchen. And I didn't care because I loved him a lot. He came, he came every year for three months. He walked the dog. He was lovely. And so I think, I really think breakages are tricky for hosts because if you get a guest you don't like break something, you're going to want them, make them want to pay for a Vegemite jar mug. You know what, you know those... <laughs> They don't, don't get it. They don't get it. All right, you're gonna, you're gonna, <laughs> all right, you're gonna make them want to pay for a paperclip they stole. Yeah. But so, yeah, I think breakages are tricky for hosts. But I think if you can get your head around the, the, the cost of doing business, of course, if they break something significant, yes. But like, if you've got really valuable things in your property, what the yeah. hell are you doing? Go get something from IKEA that doesn't matter if they break. Now, reviews, I just want to state that again. It is nobody's, it is nobody's, no guest's job to, to send you a review. It's nice. I mean, I used to love reviews, but I also never used to pester people for them because they've just got to come. And also, you're going to get bad ones. And the paying public, no, don't get your knickers in a knot about a bad review. We know when a crazy person's left you a review. We can tell. Mm, yeah, it's true. We can it's tell. True. It's, to it's totally true. You're like, uh, that's so, no, no, I was I always, for the first couple of years, I was paranoid about reviews and I was always on edge about being nice to people and not being myself. My husband would say, look, try not to be yourself too much with these ones. I'm like, all right. Um, but, you know, like, it's just bad reviews, you know, apart, when you get a bad review, you know you've made it. I, if you haven't had one yet, people watching, are you I even in business? I think if guests though, are going to give a bad review, you don't need to ask them. They'll be on there anyway. I think that the people who will give you a good review, I think you do have to give them just a little nudge. You know, even if it's just one little nudge, and I certainly find in my business, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not attached to any of the big OTAs. So I have no, my, my business all comes direct. Therefore, I really, really rely on getting my reviews out there because it helps with people finding me and um, helps the SEO on Google. So, you know, for me, it's quite an important thing to do. But I don't, you know, it's a very softly, softly touch that I do. And I think, you know, my little card has definitely worked Great wonders. Idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, love, I love that idea much more than you asking for a review in an email. I just think that's yeah. genius. Yeah. Gold stars for marketing. That's fantastic. <laughs> Love it. But but you asked for it, Hazel. You just didn't overtly ask for it. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. answer, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Um, Hazel, before we wrap it up, are there any other questions that we haven't answered? No, I think we've covered everything. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody's raised a question here on very interesting. Um, frequent sun screen staining on luxury quality bedding <laughs> when you've politely brought it to their attention in the guest information. <laughs> How do you deal with it? 
get different bedding. <laughs> if it's a continuing problem, I'm sorry, you chose mm. get different bedding. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have to take a roll in agreement. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> We actually, um, one thing you can do though, security bonds, we do it. We do it and it works amazingly. Um, if you can have somewhere just stating, I mean, if you know there is an issue that is going on every time, for example, we have seven buildings here at Skytrek Low Springs. Um, four of them are quite small. Three of them are quite large. Large generally means groups. Groups normally means breakages or um, extra mess that you really don't want to deal with. So you would be amazed at how quickly someone will really consider what they're doing as soon as you say yeah. there is a $200 bond applied to your booking. Um, the best thing you can do. I really do encourage it. Um, and honestly, people are great. They really don't mind. They understand. If you can say to them that, unfortunately, we've had some guests in the past that have just taken it for granted, um, ruined it for others, they will very quickly go, no worries, more than happy to pay the money because they know they're going to get it back in their account if they've done the right thing. Mm -hmm. The ones that haven't, they're not worth coming to your business. All right. Very good. Very good answer. Thank you. Um, Hazel, I think there's a final poll about the, the value of the webinar, right? Um, yep, I think that's being posted um, yep, at the moment. So if you, those of you who are still there, if you could jump on that, that would be brilliant. Thank you. All right. And we are up to our hour, a little over. So um, I, Hazel, I know you want to say a few closing words but before you do. Thank you. Big thanks from me. Um, uh, loved all your energy. Uh, didn't care at all that you jumped in and felt like a school child and had to do this. And it's all good. It's all good. Um, thank, thank you. For your you time. Really. That was brilliant. Um, Hazel, back to you. Yep, sure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Our next webinar in September is all about upselling. So please see our website, touchday.com, for a full list of webinars planned over the next few months. And once you've had a look at that, if, um, if any of you think that you might be a good panellist on any of these webinars, then please, please do get, get in touch, hazel at touchday.com, and we'll, we'll see whether or not we can fit you in on any of those. Thank you to our panellists today, Ali, um, Michelle, and Catherine and our attendees. And thank you, Andy, for being a brilliant host. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. See you guys. Okay, bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Hey, gold. Stay drunk. <laughs> I don't stay say good. stay safe. So <laughs> don't say stay safe. You're much more stay likely polite. to stay drunk. Why stay polite, that? Catherine. <laughs> right. not, listen, I spent 49 years being polite. No longer. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> that was terrific. Thanks for having me. I loved it.